No, not the rice. Oh, oh, this big binder here? Yeah. Oh, wow. I hereby call the order the uh, just meeting on our school board. Senator, would you please call the roll? Mrs. Cadkill. Here. Mrs. Crabtree. Here. Mr. Gambiani. Here. Mrs. Itahar. Here. Mr. Paulson. Here. Mr. Matheson is absent. Mr. Roman. Here. Mr. Mack, would you please release some pleasure please? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Matthew. Uh, does any uh, board member have any modifications to the agenda for this evening? Other than the short one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid we can't do that. No. Hearing none, we'll move on to public comments. Do we have any public comments? Or... Okay. We have two individuals signed up for public uh, comments. The opportunity to speak to the board is provided for members of the public who have questions or comments on an agenda item. The board appreciates hearing from stakeholders and values your thoughts and questions. 
board strives to make the best decisions for the district. Public input in a variety of venues is very helpful. The board must protect its civility and decorum in this meeting. Please be respectful for the duties of the board and the democratic process in your comments tonight. Please use the microphone, state your name, and whether you are a resident of the district, and address your comments to the board. Please limit your comments to three minutes. Please be factual and courteous and do not include statements that are <coughs> personally disrespectful or condescending to board members or staff. If you feel your matter needs to be discussed in more detail, please attend the board's chance to chat or present your comments to us in writing. <coughs> Uh, Ms. Uh, St Stephanie Fantrell, Thorpe. Hi, my name is Stephanie Fanthorpe. I am the Vice Chair of the Citizens Advisory Committee. For the committee's first year, we had a great group of 31 community members. I enjoy being part of this committee and feel we are off to a great start. For your reference, in your folder is a recap of the 2015-2016 meetings. We, uh, there was a great range of topics addressed, which has created an excellent foundation of information for the 2016-2017 CAC meetings, topics such as master facility plan, future of instruction and technology, and District 200 five-year financial projections. Next is a recap of the CAC Feedback and Interest Survey. Committee members completed a survey at the last meeting. The first section is learnings through CAC with feedback as follows. District is committed to effective communication with the community. Diverse student population is celebrated, excuse me, celebrated by administrators and staff. Importance of Jefferson to the community and the school in general. Financial state of district and how well the district is managed. An in-depth look at all the facilities within the district. Next is how CAC members felt about the meetings. Meetings are well organized with clear agenda and time frame. Ease of interaction with administration and com uh, committee members. Good schedule of topics. All opinions were welcomed and considered. Easy to understand presentations and materials. The last section is recommendations for future meetings. Continue to increase dialogue on topics during the meeting. Identify how members can continue CAC objectives between meetings. Send topic materials to committee members prior to meeting. Define specific areas within a topic where feedback is needed. And encourage Board of Education to identify any specific topics they would like CAC to review during the upcoming school year. Next steps, first, determine number of open slots available on CAC. We had an excellent high return rate of community members. All but three members have, all but three members have chosen to return next year. Second, advertise and solicit new members for the open spots with a desire to ensure broad representation to entire District 200 community. Thank you for your time. <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Cantor. So, uh, I think each member of the board attended at least one CAC meeting. We were unanimous in our views on how well the meetings went, the good feedback that we received, and uh, how important we think this outreach to the community is. So thank you for all your efforts. The uh, second speaker we have is Carol Watts. Carol? How you doing? Uh, I didn't realize the CAC comments were on the agenda tonight. <laughs> Uh, good evening. I'd like to make a few comments and start with the uh, VoIP contract. It's nice, it's nice that the monies can be saved by switching vendors, but at a cost of 35000 to terminate the contract, why did we sign a six-year contract that included a substantial termination fee? There's also no mention of actual cost of VoIP services to understand the magnitude of a future 40 k savings starting next year. How much do we spend annually on VoIP? Let's be transparent on costs besides savings. Next, a few comments regarding the bus service. Three years ago, the headlines of Suburban Life stated, CUSD 100 expects 300K in transportation savings. Here's the article. I wonder what the headlines will read tomorrow. Maybe transportation costs are increasing by 1.5 million next year, and where will the funds come from? 
Our current vendor won the bid three years ago for bus service because their bid was an all or nothing deal. The board approved the contract and now we're paying the consequences. The new Illinois Central contract is a cool $1 million higher than the current cost, which is a 20% increase. The 900K in savings over the past three years just vaporized. Not written in the agenda summary is the increase in transportation costs of the out-of-district students. The increase is about a half a million dollars, which is a home, almost a 100% increase. The person writing the summary must be using Common Core math because the total dollars spent, the amount of percentage increase does not matter because there's only one bid received. The contract shows a complete lack of transparency on the cost of transportation. For the taxpayers out there, trans transportation costs are going up 30% or $1.5 million this coming school year. Too bad the board and administration did not bank the four to five million dollars in savings for the 60 plus teachers retiring last year. The savings were given back as additional compensation to certified staff with nothing in return. The administration and most of the board members keep spending beyond our means and then tax the taxpayers to the max. Now you can see why the public or taxpayers do not support the last bond referendum and unlikely to support a future bond or tax rate referendum. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lox. Uh, now we have the superintendent's report, Dr. Schuler. Thank you, Mr. Broman. Uh, and just uh, one quick point of uh, clarification as I start the superintendent report. The community engagement report is on the agenda tonight. So I think the comments relative to CAC had to do with that agenda item that is actually on the agenda. A um, couple of things that I wanted to share with the board, uh, uh, though uh, kind of starting the uh, meeting this evening. Um, one is uh, just an invitation uh, at before your June meeting uh, at 645, so 45 minutes uh, prior to that meeting, uh, we are going to be hosting an open house to honor Mary Lou with members of the community. So uh, board members, I don't know if Mary Lou even knew that until uh, just a few seconds ago. I kind of feel these eyes <laughs> glaring at me. Not yet. Um, move over a little bit. <laughs> but board members, please, uh, if you'd like to, to come early and, uh, and join us, we're going to have a little you know, cake uh, reception. We've got uh, some, some folks that want to have an opportunity to uh, come by and say thank you. So we're going to be doing that. Um, second thing I wanted to share with the, the board and community tonight, a couple different points in this year. Uh, I've shared a, an exciting process that uh, Janine Kruka helped work with the high schools on this year to get approved our ability to put a seal of biliteracy on um, students' diplomas. So students um, could qualify for that seal of biliteracy or the accommodation uh, through having completed an assessment that in fact determined that, uh, that they were in fact biliterate. Um, that process is open to students who are native speakers of, uh, of a second language or students that have completed a course of study in foreign language and, and thus qualify. And so um, we had a number of students that, uh, that signed up to go through that process this year, uh, got the results back from the assessment, and there are 27 students at We North uh, that uh, have been granted either the seal or commendation, and there are 60 students at We Mournville South uh, that have, uh, uh, have qualified again with either the seal or the, the commendation. So again, uh, I think uh, really, really good news. Um, I shared with the board a little bit earlier today and uh, continue to be some discussions uh, today down in Springfield on school funding. Uh, so Senate Bill 231, that's the new version of uh, Senate Bill 16, Senate Bill 1 by Andy Menard did in fact pass out of the Senate. It has not been called in the House and, and doesn't appear as though it's, uh, it's real likely that um, that's going to get called in the House. But at the same time today, uh, there was a hearing in the, the House where uh, they were entertaining uh, comment in, uh, on the evidence-based model um, that uh, is a model uh, several organizations that the District 200 has, uh, uh, is a part of have really advocated moving this evidence-based model and it does appear to be getting um, potentially some, some good traction. So it's not officially been introduced in legislation. Um, but it was introduced in a committee hearing today, and, and I guess uh, the, the good news in terms of kind of understanding legislative process, uh, Speaker Madigan, I understand, attended that committee hearing today specifically to hear, to learn about uh, the evidence-based model. So again, I think there's some, potentially some good traction uh, around that, but um, I think 
uh, next couple of weeks and probably into the fall, uh, there's going to be quite a bit of discussion and jostling between those potential two school funding uh, bills that we'll stay on top of. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to mention as we approach the, the end of the year, I know uh, board is, uh, is, is well aware there's lots of exciting activities going on in schools between uh, Explore More Days and uh, Student Honors Assemblies and Multicultural Days and lots of, uh, of, uh, of, of really, really neat stuff uh, that's going on. So I would encourage you perhaps to maybe check in with your adopted schools and see what they have, uh, have going on. There's great opportunities at the end of the year to uh, to take part in, in one of the, the celebratory <coughs> activities, I think is, uh, sorry, Chris coming in, hard to believe we're at that point uh, in the year that appeared to come up really, really quickly, but uh, we are in that, that home stretch, and um, I'd invite you, encourage you to uh, join us for one of those activities. So that's it. Um, thank you, Dr. Schuller. <clears throat> we now move to the consent agenda, and for those who have not attended board meetings before, I'm required to read each title to the consent agenda, and tonight Dr. Schuler has challenged me with 28 items on the consent agenda plus the 29th on the consent agenda item 2, uh, so bear with me. 1. Acceptance of gift to Edison Middle School. 2. Acceptance of gift to Wheaton Warrenville South High School. 3. Approval to post board policy 7.190 student discipline, 7.20 suspension, 7.210 expulsion for public review and comment. Four, approval to post middle school math eight textbook for public review and comment. Five, approval to post high school information technology two textbook. Six, approval to adopt standards for high school course modern and contemporary literature. Seven, approval to adopt standards for high school course journalism. Eight, approval to adopt standards for high school course senior rhetoric. Nine, Approval of high school, middle school, and elementary school student handbooks for 2016-2017. 10. Appointment of the district representative to the DuPage Area Occupational Education System, DAOES, for the 2016-17 organizational year. 11. Approval of band uniform bid. 12. Approval of athletic trainer services contract proposal. 13. Approval of the extension of the advertising agreement with site effects at Wheaton North and Wheaton Warrenville South. 14. Approval to set driver education fee at $250. 15. Approval of Chartwell's food service management contract renewal. 16. Approval to switch phone service provider to call one. 17. Approval to dispose of miscellaneous surplus assets. 18. Approval of compressor and installation bid Wheaton North High School. 19, approval of bid for roof replacements at Sandberg Elementary and Monroe Middle School and ROE permit applications. 20, approval of bids for tuck pointing, basement infill, and chimney reduction at Whittier Elementary in the RE, ROE permit application. 21, approval of resolution appointing treasurer and approving the treasurer's bond. 22, <coughs> approval, of, <coughs> excuse me, approval of treasurer's bond coverage 23, approval of financial advisory agreement with PMA Financial Network. 24, approval of a resolution authorizing interfund loan from operations and maintenance fund to education fund. <coughs> Excuse me. 25, adoption of board of education meeting calendar for 2016-2017. Mm -hmm. 26, approval of bills payable and payroll. 27, approval of minutes April 13, 2016, open and closed. April 27, 2016, open and closed. And approval to destroy recordings of closed sessions prior to December 2014 as allowable by law. And 28, approval of personnel report to include employment, resignation, retirement, and leave of absence of administrative, administrative certified, classified, and non-union staff. Are there any items board members want to move from the consent agenda? Hearing none. Um, any additional information from you, Dr. Schuler, or his dad? No, I think other than to say, obviously, the consent agenda uh, was very long. Uh, there were a number of items on it, and, and we did have an opportunity, I think, to ans uh, have answer lots of uh, questions that board members had about individual items. So um, I know that uh, those items have been thoroughly vetted with no additional information. Are there any comments or questions from board members with respect to consent items in this department? 
I would just like to ask if there are any clarifications staff can give on the uh, telephone uh, service um, to answer the community question tonight. Not to argue, but just to clarify for us that, that we feel good that we're making a good um, choice here. Sure. Is there's uh, three large areas of savings in this. Um, one is the PRI savings, just the cost of the PRIs. We have eight of them. Uh, call one comes in about $150 less per PRI for, per month. Uh, the tolls, uh, which is the calls, AT&T charges us for those, and call one, the uh, tolls are included. So you know, if they give your cell phone with unlimited minutes, the actual calls, local and toll, are included on that. Call one also has a special agreement with the state because they're only in Illinois that there's no local te uh, fees or taxes on that and then the last bit of it is a uh, savings at the Centrex lines um, they've worked out a plan to move quite a few of those still 102 that we have to the PRIs and then only keeping I think 41 of them each one of those the PRI savings is around 1200 a month uh, the toll fees and taxes are about 1500 a month and the Centrex is about 1100 a month that's in its best case scenario, or worst case scenario. That's about, you know, there's estimates that show if we were to cancel more that it would be larger than that. But after its first year, we're projecting somewhere between 40 and 50,000 savings a month. Or a year, sorry, a month. Wow, that'd be great. <laughs> a year, a year. Okay, so, so for the first year, we're, uh, we're just about even paying that penalty? Uh, yeah, the to first year will be a little, probably under $10,000 um, worst case scenario savings um, from switching to pay the cancellation. The other thing that was stated too is it was a six year contract. We actually upped that part of the contract last year. They're usually done in three years. So we're exiting this contract about two years early. Okay. Um, Mr. Hoffman, I would like us to um, think about in this next year, the, the school handbooks. Um, I spent a lot of time reading them this past weekend, the, the, the different handbooks, and you know, I have a, I have brought my daughters, and um, it goes from pages eight to 59. That's a lot of reading that we're expecting our parents and our students to sign this handbook, that they've read this and that they agree and that they understand it. And I think there's some language in there that can get cleaned up. For example, my, my daughter is, is in a booth, and I sent her, because I read it this weekend, with $5 to get her elevator key, and, they said to her, why are you bringing this in? We don't, we don't follow, we, don't, it, 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 we haven't followed it in years, but yet it's still in the handbook. So I think we can go through and maybe clean it up a little bit um, to things that are, are relevant. I feel that you know, if we're asking parents and students to sign something, we want them to actually read it. And this is really a lot of reading to do. So, um, and I'd also like to maybe clean up a little bit of common language and it, you know, what's written for you know, the things that are common across the different um, buildings, you know, the different grade levels, to be able to say, worded in the same way, you know, when, we're, when the intent is actually the same. So if we could spend some time this year maybe in, in cleaning that up a little bit so that, um, modernize it, and um, so that, you know, make sure that what's in here, we're actually enforcing. Yeah, I just would echo the same sentiment. I mean, I went through it. Had similar reaction to a lot of the things we're asking every parent in our school district of students currently to go through this. And, um, I think the, you, using the word modernization is probably good. I mean, I think probably the only reason we were even had to sign the agenda is because of the student discipline issue. And I recall we received some emails from parents not, um, I think in the last couple of years about the student ID, I remember something about a student ID, the bus pass was a lost student ID that wasn't being followed by uh, the local school either. So. I agree that you know we probably at this point need to approve it just because of the calendar, but over the next year, it certainly is probably worth a, a more <coughs> in detail look um, to make sure that it's consistent and you know, a little less uh, the owners that are recognizing that you know, from a legal standpoint, there's certain things we have to have a good understanding. Okay, so that's that's the follow kind of the same question that uh, Mrs. Zintahar asked with respect to call one consent item agenda. What, what is the background that you shared with us with respect to the bus uh, contract for approval under the consent agenda? The bus is not under consent. I think that's under action oh. item. So we, we will. My mistake. <clears throat> yeah, so we had a uh, focus on reading the title from here. <laughs> <laughs> 
so uh, to the the handbook piece as well, just for um, I, I think kind of worthy to understand it. Um, can you just kind of summarize the process that we go through? I think they're valid comments, and we certainly will do that. But I don't want to leave folks with the impression that that hasn't gone through annually a, a vetting process. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Sherman. Um, each year, the administrators at each level read those books from cover to cover and make those appropriate edits. Um, and you're right, each year the book gets a little longer. Um, much of that has to do with additional mandates and additional requirements, um, and the majority is uh, are uh, responsible for legal things that we have to be able to say that we've shared that whole technology section with the donors is part of the responsibility under statute that we have to share with people. Um, we haven't, um, we probably could do a, a, a cross walk between all three. We did that with the discipline section this year in response to um, SB7. Um, and we can certainly do that with all of those to make sure that they're those consistent things. Um, they, they try to word them based on the, on the elementary, middle, and high school things, but certainly there's some things that we can probably clean up. I'm not sure it's going to get a lot of shorter, um, but we may be able to make some of those, some of that language we'll clean up. But each administrator, each group looks at those completely and then as you saw in the background, the parent advisory, the parent staff advisory group went through it as well. Um, we did miss the, the key thing um, and, and found that afterwards. And it'll go through one more edit before it goes to the publisher. And send it to the publisher, they'll look at it one more time for punctuation and, and uh, misspelling. But um, we'll do a crosswalk with those three next year to see if we can do some consistency. Thank you, Dr. Emmer. Any other comments, questions on the consent agenda? If not, I ask for a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Moved by Mrs. Entar. Second. Seconded by Mrs. Crantree. Mrs. Sender, would you please call the roll? Mrs. Entar. Yes. Mrs. Crabtree. Yes. Mr. Gambiani. Yes. Mrs. Cockhill. Yes. Mr. Halser. Yes. Mr. Broman. Yes, the motion passes. We do have a consent agenda item two, uh, the approval of the resolution designating depositories. This is separated out because uh, Mr. Um, Matheson, if he is here, would have had to abstain from this. Uh, what's the background information on this, Dr. Schroeder? Mr. Farley, you comment on that? Annually, we just asked the board to approve the list of depositories that the school district does business with. And as you mentioned, Mr. Matheson uh, sits on the board of Weed Bank and Trust, who is one of the depositories, so we choose for the consent agenda too, so uh, he can abstain from that vote, but obviously he's here tonight. Any questions or comments from board members? Hearing none, I ask for a motion and a second to approve the consent item agenda as presented. So moved. Moved by Mr. Paulson. Second. Seconded by Mrs. Cockhill. Mrs. Sender, would you please call the roll? Mr. Paulson. Yes. Mrs. Cockhill. Yes. Mr. Gambiani. Yes. Mrs. Crabtree. Yes. Mrs. Intahar. Yes. Mr. Groman. Yes. The motion passes. Now we move on to action items. And the first action item is the approval of transportation services contract. Um, Dr. Schuert. Uh, Mr. Farley, uh, introductory comments on Sure, thank you, Dr. Schuller. This is the end of the third year of our contract <coughs> with uh, both SEPTRAN, who provides our out of district special ed transportation, as well as Illinois Central, who provides our in district regular ed special education, as well as out of di or in district special education. Um, we went out to bid. Um, we're seeing what a lot of our neighboring school districts are seeing as their bids are coming in as well, and that's double digit increases. And really, the, the factor that's at play here is uh, probably a sign of the times of the economy getting better that the ability for companies to attract and, and retain drivers has been a significant challenge. Uh, other competitors in the marketplace have increased uh, uh, cost uh, or increased salaries, which has increased cost, and that's obviously passed back on into school districts. So we went out to bid. We did receive one bid for uh, base bid A, which is our in-district regular. Uh, we had two very competitive bids for the in-district special ed. Uh, we are staying with the incumbent and then the out of district was uh, one bidder and that was South Trainer. So uh, we're asking the board to approve the contract tonight. Please know a couple things. First, uh, 
uh, we've already had conversations with uh, with Illinois Central to talk about ways we can continue to streamline and find efficiencies to try and save costs uh, associated with uh, this increase. Um, I always, when I'm doing the levy or talking about the consumer price index, get on my soapbox about how the price of gas really doesn't impact us. Uh, but in this case, that we do have some impact because of the fuel escalator clause that's in the contract. We have, have a budget this year of 350000 and have only spent 10000 because the price of gas has gone down. So we will be able to absorb some of this increase uh, because of the will I'll walk the board through all of this as we go through the budgeting process. Uh, but we are going to look for efficiencies in the other as I've talked to Dr. Panopoulos about the out of district special ed. We're looking for efficiencies there as well to try and absorb this cost. But really, uh, it's driven by what's happening in the marketplace. And again, we're seeing other districts that have gone out uh, and, and seen the same thing happen. So uh, we are going to continue to monitor it closely and, uh, and to try and find ways, as we always do, to streamline and find efficiencies. Any questions? I'll try and answer. Mark, is the fuel escalation the uh, did that change at all, or is that on the same basis as it was this year? And we kept it the same. The index was kept the same. <coughs> Any other questions or comments? <coughs> Bill, I just have uh, one question. I see here legal notice was published and bid packages were sent to twelve potential vendors. I mean, I know you don't have a, a silver ball. I mean. A, you're not clairvoyant here, but crystal ball. But why do you think we only got technically one response to, to the bid? Yeah, we were surprised. You know, we're we're we are a big district, so you you're not going to get some of the smaller bus companies that will want to bid our service. We run over 300 regular routes a day, uh, so whoever is going to be out there has got to be pretty large. Uh, uh, straight out, we were very surprised for a student to bid and bid this. I would tell you that our. You know, our own bus company who we currently use was surprised Illinois, excuse me, first student in, in this. So uh, we did reach out to them and they were concerned about fleet and some other issues. They uh, were our, our uh, previous uh, vendor. So we were, were very surprised they have a Glen Allen terminal, um, but they chose not to bid in. I think we may be the only district they chose not to bid in all the pool of different uh, ones out there. So so very surprised that we weren't, there wasn't, there wasn't more competition at that base bid day. So were there a lot of other school districts in the area also bidding at the same time? I know in my field, you know, the timing of the bid and the, the, the amount of work that's out there has a big impact on whether people choose to bid. Is that an issue that we might have run into? Uh, I think we were out in a timely fashion. We did Glenbar open right before us, Batavia opened after us, uh, other ones um, around the same time. So we, we were kind of right there in the middle of it all. Um, you know, again, if we, as we look at it and going forward, we may choose to get out a little bit earlier um, in the future, just to make sure that we have, uh, you know, that are you know, trying to get as competitive as we can. But I wouldn't say we were late by any stretch of means. Seeing no further, hearing no further questions or comments, I ask for a motion and a second to approve the uh, transportation services contract bid. So moved. Moved by Mrs. Crabtree. Second. Seconded. Seconded by Mrs. Eckerhart. Mrs. Senator, would you please call the roll? Mrs. Crabtree? Yes. Mr. Paulson? Yes. I'm sorry, Mrs. Eckerhart? <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> yes. Mrs. Coghill? Yes. Mr. Gambiani? Yes. Mr. Roman? Yes. The motion passes. The second action item before us is the approval of a resolution providing for the issue of not to exceed $34,865,000 in general obligation of refunding school bonds series 2016 of the district for the purpose of refunding certain outstanding bonds of the school district providing for the levy of a direct annual tax sufficient to pay the principal and interest on said bonds and authorizing the sale of bonds to the purchaser thereof. Um, Dr. Schuller. Oh, I need to announce that. Announce that. So, Dr. Schuler. So, I, I can give just a little bit of background and then uh, Mr. Farley make any comments. Um, the, the, dating back to February of 2014, the board looked at a long term strategy to uh, refinance debt and 
uh, to cure what was kind of a key uh, of a ski slope in um, your debt service payments and so the district at that time uh, looked at what it knew was going to be a multi-step uh, process to refinance that debt and this is the second of I think four ultimate uh, uh, steps in that, that process. So Mr. Farley, any additional background you want to provide? No, I think that's perfect. Yeah. And I think one thing to, to point out on, on this, this is just truly uh, refinancing existing bonds at a lower rate. This is not extending out debt service at all and uh, the bulk of the savings are going to be used to address kind of the first year where there's a marked increase up in that uh, that ski slope. That's when the, the savings will be seen like a chunk of it in that one year. So. Uh, just to respond to a question that was raised at the last CAC meeting about this bond refinancing, with uh, the members of the CAC council were advised that there would be about two and a half million dollars savings that would be piled back and reduce the amount of the outstanding bonds. One member of the uh, council asked, well, why don't we just use that 250, uh, 2.5 million and apply it to capital needs? Well, I asked Dr. Schuler that question. And by school code, we are not able to do a cash out refunding. Um, we could capture the savings by issuing offsetting non-referendum bonds that could fund the capital improvements, but in essence, we'd be robbing pay, Peter to pay Paul. So we don't, we don't get ahead at all by doing that. So that's why it's not being used to the 2.5 million dollars in savings. Huh? It's not being used for capital projects. <coughs> so just to clarify, most of this, or almost all this two and a half million is saved in, I think it was the levy year 2018, is that correct? So I got a question on, I guess it's like or page nine in the PMA report where they show the, uh, the current debt service, for, I don't know if it's possible to pull that up. Um, so the current debt service um, structure out to your 2024 and there's a blue bar and, and a green bar green, the green bars future years and future phase two phase or phase three and phase four restructuring when we get there no potential future oh that's what okay. that's d set that's, that's, that's potential the set, yeah. the board chooses to access the so the blue the blue bars on an annual basis are what we project to reduce the debt curve to based on this one and future Phase three and phase four refinancing. So that that's that curve drops down pretty substantially, which would impact the debt service levy that we have to incur every year. That's outside of the operating. Correct. Okay. Any additional comments or questions? If not, um, before I ask for a motion and a second, the resolution that we're about to vote on sets forth the parameters for the issuance of said bond and sale thereof by designated officials of the district and summarize the pertinent terms of said um, parameters, including the specific parameters governing the manner of sale, length of maturity, and rates of per interest, purchase price, and tax levy for said bonds. I have a motion and a second to approve a resolution provided for the issue of not to exceed 34865000 general obligation to refunding school bonds, series 2016, of the district for the purpose of refunding certain outstanding bonds of the school district providing for the levy of a direct annual tax sufficient to pay the principal and interest on said bonds and authorizing the sale of the bonds to the purchaser thereof. So that's all I have. Thank you. Moved by Mr. Paulson, seconded by Mrs. Entahar. Mrs. Sender, would you please call the roll? Yes. Okay. It's now your turn to read. The resolution providing for the issue of not to exceed $34,865,000 general obligation refunding school bonds series 2016 of community unit school district number 200 in Page County, Illinois for the purpose of refunding certain outstanding bonds of said school district, providing for the levy of a direct annual tax sufficient to pay the principal and interest on said bonds and authorizing the sale of the bonds to the purchaser thereof. We have a motion and a second, so Mr. Sender, would you please call the roll? Mr. Paulson? Yes. Mrs. Intahar? Yes. Mrs. Crabtree? Yes. Mr. Gabbiani? Yes. Mrs. Cockhill? Yes. Mr. Roman? Yes. The motion passes. 
We now move into discussion item, uh, and that's the continuation of our discussion on the facility master plan. Dr. Schuller. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Veroman. So uh, just kind of a, a quick recap, uh, both for the board and uh, anybody uh, here tonight, uh, following the discussion on the master facility plan. The master facility plan uh, was delivered to the board uh, at your meeting on April the 13th. Um, a voluminous uh, report uh, that, uh, that had a number of different items and opportunities uh, uh, in it. We've had two discussions uh, thus far on the master facility plan, one at the committee, the whole meeting on the 27th, uh, and then the board engaged in a, in a full day committee, the whole meeting on <coughs> April the 30th um, to, again, make sure that we uh, had a chance to process everything in that report, all of the priorities, and then have some some discussion. And so, uh, I wanted to first mention to the to the board uh, we don't often have full day workshop sessions, and so the minutes from that session were a little bit longer than the minutes uh, typically are from from meetings. Um, we included in your agenda packet uh, this evening a copy of the draft minutes uh, from that meeting. Um, and I would encourage uh, all board members, um, if you haven't done so already, to please take a careful look um, at those minutes. We certainly want to make sure that they accurately capture kind of the, the uh, volume of that discussion uh, on the 30th. And so, uh, again, I would encourage you to take a, a careful look at that. Um, I guess a suggestion uh, would be if you have, uh, have feedback, you've got corrections or uh, adjustments to uh, the, the min meeting minutes from the 30th uh, and can can get those uh, to me um, suggestion would have to, to process it this way we typically handle all uh, adjustments to meeting minutes just through our office with uh, uh, with mrs. sender with uh, three board clerk but but given again kind of the volume of, of these minutes uh, uh, I was going to suggest that any any uh, suggested changes to those meeting minutes come to us and that we have the facility committee take uh, one final look at those minutes before they come back for uh, approval at your next meeting. Again, just essential, I think, that we make sure that, that we have an accurate representation of what happened at that meeting on the third. Okay. I, I just don't like the precedent that that sets. I think that, that you know minutes are minutes and they should be handled in the same way that other minutes are handled. And now, you know, if if there's a difference of opinion and you want to, you know, check with the president or whatever, I think that's fine. But to put another filter uh, on minutes, I think is I think it sets a dangerous precedent that we we maybe don't want to go down that path. Well, I understand that. I did go through the minutes in great detail, and, and I think there's, there's a lot of clarifications and consistencies that can be developed. In um, my fear is that if we put minutes out there that don't have a little bit that additional filter, that it, it would be maybe misinterpreted incorrectly by some members of the community or even some members of the board. So I think there'd be great value in um, kind of putting another filter on those and make sure that the, it's not just minutes, but it's also kind of a guide to how we're going to um, well, board. Because I don't think the minutes, as I went through a great detail, so I don't think the minutes are very quick. I don't think they're either, but I, I, I don't disagree that the community may need more, but the community typically gets very succinct minutes from all of our meetings, and all of those, it, it goes through this, the review process as typical. If, you want, if, the if the facilities committee wants to write a separate report based on those minutes, I don't have any problem with that, but I don't think the facilities committee should em embellish, and I don't mean stretch. I mean, I just mean, I don't think they should put their lens on those meeting minutes. I think those meeting minutes need to stand as minutes, and if the facilities committee wants to make a report based on those minutes, saying here are the outcomes, and be more specific. I think that's the road to go with that, not having a board committee bless or not bless minutes. That was a meeting of the whole board, not of the facilities committee. It, 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 it's a sticky point, but it's a point that I think I just don't think we want to set that precedent that we're going to take minutes of a meeting that we all had and have a two-person committee review them and put their their stamp of approval on them. I don't think that's correct procedure. 
were you asking us just to review them and, and so when we really decide what our priorities are to use use it or change it or do you really were saying we want to what do we want to put out as minutes no I, I'm just asking all board members to take a look take a careful look at the minutes and make sure that the minutes reflect the conversation that that took place at that meeting on the, the 30th I guess I you know, from from my perspective I, I, I wasn't suggesting and I certainly wouldn't want the impression that that I'm suggesting that a set a set of minutes for the entire board are being you know kind of crafted in some way by uh, a committee I just I just am anticipating that we might get more feedback on this set of minutes than we do the other if, if you're not comfortable with a committee doing that certainly another strategy would be to, to I, I can work with the executive uh, group from the board to uh, look at any of those suggestions and you know, I, I, I'm just wanting to make sure that the minutes accurately reflect the board's discussion from that day in all of our minutes, all of our minutes have been summaries. I know there have been times when, when I, as a board member, have given a long, lengthy explanation, and in the minutes, it's a very succinct sentence. I think these minutes should be written just like those minutes. And and I think if we, if the facilities committee wants to write a report, here's the outcome of the meeting, <coughs> here's where we're going from here, and wants to put some details behind those minutes, I I I'm firmly in favor of that. I just don't want to set the precedent that for some meetings we're going to do it this way and for other meetings we're going to do it a different way. I think that's dangerous and a slippery slope. I'm, I'm fine with that. I mean, I've given, I just heard with Dr. Schuler this morning pretty extensive comments on them. Everybody has the opportunity, we're going to get another point in the next meeting where we have to prove them and so we'll have another one for it. So, I mean, it was what a seven hour meeting with lots of conversation going on. So, I, I appreciate how difficult gathering that all the information was, much of it in a different language that we typically talk about in a board meeting here. So, um, I'm, I'm comfortable with that process. I, I agree with you. I just want to make sure that it is clear and reflects the conversation. Well, I think uh, I would prefer is, is to have everyone write their comments to the minutes that. That Dr. Schuler circulated, um, and um, the executive committee or the, or the board secretary, vice president, and president will work with uh, Dr. Schuler and uh, his center to see if we can then come up with a final draft of the minutes to present to the board at the next meeting for approval. And uh, I would encourage the facilities committee if they either want to report or submit their own uh, collective comments to those minutes to do so as well. That's really appropriate. Until the point we'll take this time. Okay. Um, so the second thing that we wanted to uh, to do tonight was bring back to you uh, and the buckets. Uh, we called them buckets at the meeting on the 30th. Those were kind of the project groupings uh, that were identified um, by level. Make sure that we captured those uh, accurately. Um, we pulled together, uh, I guess again, what I would, would uh, call at this point still concept costs for, for each of those buckets. So these are the dollar amounts that, uh, that were identified as part of the, the master facility plan report. And I think the, the goal this evening is one, to make sure that we have those, uh, those buckets identified accurately and two, that uh, charge is clear in terms of follow-up information for what kind of, uh, of additional uh, detail information that we need to begin to process those. So, um, uh, again, just uh, um, kind of by, by way of, uh, of summary, out of the conversation, this little uh, uh, pie chart uh, just gives you a, a, a feel for kind of where the, the project buckets fell. So other middle school, uh, middle school projects represented about 37% uh, of what was identified. Early childhood, Jefferson, about 22%. Um, secure entries, about 2% of the overall uh, budget at this point. Uh, the LLC is 15%. Um, science labs, 6% uh, of the, the overall uh, uh, project uh, buckets, accessibility and collaboration, 2 and 3%, uh, and then there's some, some other miscellaneous pieces that, uh, that we'll get at. Um, so for the elementary and early childhood level, 
Um, the the uh, project buckets that came out uh, were one looking at the Early Learning Center, Early Childhood Center. Uh, Sandberg Elementary School had a little more complex uh, redesign in order to be able to address both the secure entry and the LLC concept and some uh, uh, general accessibility, circulation, and safety within the building. So it was kind of it's a standalone project. The elementary LLCs. Uh, uh, in, in total, uh, came in at, at a, a concept cost of 4.9 million. Uh, elementary furniture, uh, so in the, the furniture concept, we did pull together a furniture plan for uh, each building that looked at every instructional space within that building and some standardized costs in terms of, uh, of student desks. Uh, there was some discussion on the 30th about making sure that if we're looking at a furniture solution, um, for our classroom that it also encompasses uh, any, any related teacher space or, or storage needs associated with um, kind of the, the newer 21st century uh, furniture models. So um, again, at the elementary level, furniture was a bucket uh, and uh, projected cost of 2.9 million and then secure entries uh, were 1.2 million for them all together and then collaborative spaces, again, those were uh, not identified at every building. Some of our buildings already have uh, those spaces built in, but there were several buildings uh, where that was a part of the plan. Uh, that was a bucket at 1.2 million. At the middle school level, uh, so again, these are uh, these are your the educational uh, assessment designs only. These are not incorporating. Um, any of the, the capital costs, we'll get the, to those um, a little bit later, but Franklin obviously was the biggest project uh, at the middle schools with concept cost of uh, a little over 22 million. Uh, Monroe uh, was, uh, was a project identified at uh, nine and a half uh, million concept costs, Edison just a little over three. And then again, the middle school furniture uh, used the, the same analysis to look at uh, all the middle school classrooms and what a potential furniture plan uh, would look like in that uh, you know, Does that include Hubble? In that? that does include Hubble. Uh, and then at the high school level, um, uh, and that one bubble gets really, really small. It's kind of hard to see from uh, back in the back. I apologize. But uh, high school, again, uh, we looked at a furniture plan uh, for the high school. Uh, the Wheaton Warrenville South Library Learning Center uh, was identified at a project that uh, at a little over a million, and then the Wheaton North Media uh, Lab, I think, is three hundred thousand. I can't really see it from from here. But those are three three high school projects. And then on the capital side, uh, and Jr., if you want to come up, I'm going to let you elaborate uh, on this a little bit. Uh, again, uh, in buckets that we pulled together here, we pulled out uh, just what are the condition one items uh, within the capital report. So the condition one items alone uh, for year one total a little over $10 million, year two condition one year two a little over $10 million and then condition one year three um, a little bit over $30 million. But one of the, the things that I asked JR to do in advance of this meeting uh, and talk to the board a little bit about is beyond the condition one items, those are kind of the immediate, most immediate needs that have been identified um, through that capital report. What are some of kind of the highest priority condition two uh, items that either would make sense to address at the same time that some of the other projects are at play or just items that would be higher in the priority list if the, the board is kind of looking at attacking that whole capital projects piece. So, JR? Thank you, Dr. Schuler. Um, I'll preface my comments by saying that the numbers I'm going to present um, do not include the middle schools and the Jefferson, Woodland, SSC, December, as we look at those as different projects because of the size and scope of the educational site. So I won't bore you with the details by each school, but in general, we looked at all the condition ones for each school, and then like Dr. Schuler said, um, what makes sense to do if we're going to do it. So for instance, in some schools, one school in particular, um, in condition one, we have about $1.3 million of roofs. Another 500 grand finishes up all the roofs. It kind of makes sense from an economic sense, to pull them all together, all at once to do it. So we would pull those twos into the ones, and get them all done at once and finish that. Um, we're doing, um, at one school, we're doing all the ceilings, uh, low, uh, over the building. Well, 
we've always wanted to place the HVAC systems in the classroom with virtual unit events like we have at North, Johnson, and Hubble. And to do that, you have to duct the uh, heat and cooling about the ceiling, which means you have to rip the ceiling out. So if we're going to take the ceilings out, it makes a lot of sense to do all that at once. So we looked at where things made sense. At one school, we're doing a lot of asphalt. And it's at Johnson, and the school is 27 years old. And if we're going to replace the asphalt in front there, and as you all know, it needs to be done. We might as well get the concrete done at the same time. So we get all that done. So we've pulled that concrete forward. So to give you a total, um, for these buildings, um, minus the eight I mentioned earlier, it's about $30 million of condition one, and anywhere from eight and a half to $12 million of condition two. between those numbers and what you're showing up there. So okay. that is a condition one of the entire district. That includes every building. Right. I have excluded from my from my discussion the four middle schools, because those are those projects are fairly large projects on their own. We need to make some decisions on what we do with the middle schools. And then I didn't include Jefferson. Again that's its own standalone project. And then Woodland, SSC, and Sam. So the remaining buildings, the condition one, totals 30 million, 29 million here on top. And then condition two and three totals, anywhere between 8.5 and 11.9 million. Chair, the bubbles though that are shown here for condition one, two, and three, those, those bubbles include the middle schools or don't include the middle schools? Yeah, what you're looking on the, on the screen includes all the districts. Okay. So when you take those out, you take out the middle schools, Jefferson, Woodland, and what was the other one? SSC and Sanford. SSC and Sanford. Instead of having 51.7 million, you've got 28. 30, 30 million. Okay. Okay. So that's so you have know, condition one to years one through three. Okay. What what that what that doesn't include, but again I'm just trying to come up another way to look at this intent in terms of potential project buckets is what, what it means is that this Sandberg bucket, which are really the educational related improvements, that number might get a little bit bigger when you tie in the capital items that would be associated with it. So that's one of the things that, uh, that I think would be a very intentional follow up would be refining the Sandberg plan specifically. Same would be true on the middle school side. So these include just the, uh, the educational related items. Obviously, if we tie in all of the capital items for those three schools as well, those circles get a little bit bigger, but then that's a little different way of like, like the way that JR had of kind of looking at the capital side to, uh, to not just look at the condition one stuff, but where does it make sense to go a little bit deeper on that side. Frank, Franklin Middle School was one of my adopted schools that I talked about, and it's the biggest bubble on all these things, I guess. And when you put the, the capital needs together and you put the educational needs together, there's a lot of overlap, I believe, in those numbers, and that's what Nicholas Associates will help us with. But I also believe there's, there's a term called cost avoidance, that if you do a project like Franklin, there's a lot of a lot of items in category or condition two in years four through eight that are just going to go away. Mm -hmm. So that number would come down substantially based on the work that we would do as part of it. So it's, it's kind of the same concept, bring it, bring it forward. Um, so when we look at these, these, for example, the middle schools, but really especially um, Franklin, you're going to see a lot of synergy between the work. And the other thing is when we look at Jefferson, you know, there's there's roughly five million dollars in condition one that has to get done. That if we don't do the additional renovation scheme, that five million dollars goes away. So there's a lot of a lot of overlapping 
circles or buckets here as we move forward and try to develop <coughs> whatever we would consider doing in the first place of this. So can you guess for Franklin, you know, would it ever get, I know we kind of touched on build a new one versus all this updating. Is there any sense to that? Um, so, no, I, well, I think we need to pull those numbers together and really see where that kind of aggregate bubble comes in for the, the middle school. So, uh, uh, I mean, that's, that's really where we've got uh, Nicholas focusing their greatest energy or on those big projects that we want to really spend a lot of time cost estimating, honestly, to uh, have, an, an, I don't want to call them smaller buckets because they're important, but you know some, some of the pieces around like LLCs and furniture and those elements, I think um, you can feel fairly good about where those cost estimates sit right now. It's really those bigger projects that would include Sandburg, Franklin, Edison, and, and Monroe, where I think we'd want to want to capture that energy. But what we would do if, if, I guess, the way that JR talked about the capital needs, if that makes sense to you, um, just in terms of kind of keeping track or capturing these project buckets, um, I would, would replace this look at the condition one items with the way that JR looked at the condition one items, which would be all the buildings absent <coughs> where those big projects are and and then uh, we will we'll come back to oops I keep going the wrong way I apologize um, we will come we'll come back to these as we kind of pull or refine costs together and and try to give you at the at your June meeting just one project bucket for Franklin with the first look one project bucket for Monroe one for Edison and one for Sandra I agree, that's absolutely the right way to do it. Um, you're in a building, there's no there, there's no point in restricting yourself to one condition in year one or year two when you have other things that can be impacted. It's gonna be much, it's gonna be a significant cost savings to do it all at one time rather than have to come back two, three, four years later. So I, I think it's right now. And JR, just make sure I have wrote these numbers down quickly. If I roll in the condition two items, or when you roll in the condition two items, that makes sense to address when you're doing this work at, at the buildings that we're considering other than Sandburg and the middle schools. It, that uh, condition, those condition two items are between 8.5 million and 11 million. Yeah, and 11, nine. And the condition one cost for those buildings is about 30 million. Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. So the condition two was again 10.5? 8.5. 8.5. 11.9. Somewhere in there. Okay. And I'll just remind everybody, these are just estimates at this point in time. Yes. Yeah. Very, very early, very term. They're not cost yet. And Chair, just to get on, on the record again, the other category for capital is primarily plumbing. Correct. Plumbing, concrete, fencing, fire alarm, ceilings. But primarily plumbing, am I right in saying that's like a big token? Yeah, I actually split that all split that out. I don't have anything. <coughs> plumbing is a big one. Yeah, it's a lot of the ADA bathrooms. talking about other in the capital now. Yes. When you're talking about other in the educational. I'll defer that to Dr. Schiller. Are they too big? Like there's a 50% of other in the education. Um, On the first side. District-wide educational improvements by category. Other those middle schools. Those are middle, so those are the middle school improvements. That 37%. 
Okay. Those are your uh, your projects at the three middle schools. Um, what's in the 13%? Uh, the 13% th really covers any of the projects that don't fall into those other categories. Right. Right. So it might be uh, circulation improvements or, or, uh, or office or office sandberg. locations. Um, sandberg it would be would be included in there as well. Yeah. So does that mean that the security entry for sandberg is really in that other and that in the security entries? Hmm. Yeah, because it's it's a it's whole so project. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, it just like you know, it's a lot of other. Yeah. You know, and sometimes other is usually small compared to the rest of everything. So I wanted to make sure I understood it. Okay. So I guess again, uh, question. Uh, just if I can can recap the the uh, the buckets that we've captured. Does that reflect accurately? Of what the the board was interested in, kind of seeing in these concepts. I mean, that captures everything from Saturday that we talked about being able to kind of capture into project options. I missed anything? Have we missed anything? No, I, I, my recollection is those are the right buckets. Um, early childhood solution number we show up there is based on a renovation and expansion option which I believe we all agreed upon and compare that number to another solution that doesn't make any sense. So the blue would get bigger and look the margin would get bigger. And I'm wondering uh, I'm wondering if we should keep putting that up there if we've decided we're not gonna do it. I mean shouldn't we have something else up there based on something else? I mean, I, I mean, I'm, do we need to take a vote to say we're going to build a new, uh, that if this project moves forward, we would choose based on the economics of the situation, a new early childhood center versus a renovation expansion option? Because I, I, I kind of want to make sure that we start <coughs> telling our community as we're making decisions, as we're talking about things and eliminating options, that this is what we're doing, and I, I'm thinking that the more we keep this out there, the more they have in their heads that this is where we're headed. And I'm, I'm starting to get a little bit nervous about that. So I guess I think to a couple things in terms of, of next steps. So next part of the discussion is on, on early childhood. So one of the things that uh, board asked on Saturday was to take a look at any other existing District 200 school sites that could possibly accommodate kind of a joint venture with a, an early learning center. And so uh, Michael did take a look at that. Michael, I don't know if you want to make any kind of general comments, but the board saw that it was with the, the, the board packet we gave you that that test fit. I think the the kind of the quick synopsis is uh, there's not a site that jumps out as a as a very good option. And a big part of that is you just don't have a lot of open space available to you, uh, to you in your sites. Uh, you know, our, our school buildings, uh, I think, are, are, you know, for the most part, are sized appropriately. Our, we don't have huge school sites that would likely accommodate uh, an, an additional space absent taking away a big chunk of, uh, of those play fields. So in, in our view, um, uh, the recommendation is that there's really not uh, not a good viable option for that. But Michael, you want to expand on that at all? No, I think I, I think that it's pretty much at the at the root of uh, what we saw. You know, you, you you have very well utilized sites for all of, all of your schools um, uh, that that really have. There are places that you could put a building, but that really detracts from the utilization of the site and how the how the uh, the school will operate. And that's that's what's shown in those those diagrams. <coughs> the second attachment that was with your your, your board packet, you can, uh, oh, can pull the other attachment. Up. There's a with the, gotcha. the agenda item. There's another attachment. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. I just I don't have that one. Oh, it's on the other one. Grab it. So and just to kind of talk about that in a little bit more depth. 
the, the idea that we talked about on April 30th for people who weren't there in the audience or watching on the TV um, was, is there some kind of synergy that we can create by um, locating our early childhood program on the site of an existing building and maybe recapture some of the space such as gymnasiums or libraries from the existing school? A couple challenges with that, from the, just from the, the sheer usage space, I don't even know that any of our elementary schools would say that their, their gymnasiums are underutilized at all. So that notion is, we have to be really explored a lot deeper about that, what is the impact on the elementary school. But the other thing is, you know, putting at a large building, 50,000, 48,000 square feet on an existing site, you're gonna create other cost implications that have to do with uh, tying into the existing building, adding parking on top of the parking that's either replaced or you know, relocated because of the addition, uh, traffic circulation, possible roadway improvements, the impact of stormwater, which will have to be dealt with pretty substantially if we were to put it on an elementary site. site you don't have room to do a stormwater detention, so you're going to put it underground, which is going to be a huge increase. Complete loss or relocation of play space for the schools. And that's a pretty uh, important element of our elementary school program is to have that exterior play space. So I don't believe that even if you were able to find a site that fit, that the cost savings would really be that different. I would conceivably even would be more to do it on an existing site versus building building a new building, clean clean site somewhere else. So. Um, you know, I looked at it in great detail. I appreciate the level of uh, analysis you guys went through so quickly, but I agree that there's no existing sites, elementary or middle, that it really fits and would even be functional. And just to explore it a little bit more, Brad, there was a suggestion that perhaps something could be done adding on to Whittier because, or a common use of a gym, but all of According to the analysis that you've done, our, all our elementary schools are using their gym facilities pretty much all day long. Okay. Yes, that's correct. And and the Whittier site also, the, the gymnasium is located at a far, the far distance from any open land here. So um, that's that's one challenge with the, any addition to the, to this building, as well as any site access and, and parking, as, as Brad mentioned. Uh, Parking is pretty limited here as it is, so the impact on the neighborhood would be, would be, uh, would be also pretty large. I, I guess I would argue that gym, the gym thing, I, I taught at Whittier when Whittier had 650 students and Whittier is now, what, 400 students? I mean, we were able to accommodate with the two gyms that are, the, the, the two gyms that are there. I understand the, the, the flooding issue here, and, and you know, originally I think I was the one who said maybe we could do something with this SSC, you know, build on to, to Whittier to be able to capture and, and be able to use that. Um, I happened to be out at Hubble today, and I was looking out a window, and um, Mr. Pilkington was standing there there with me, and I saw this large field, and I asked who, who was this, and he said that was the BP had donated that back to the district. So is what, there's like, there's like a big, he didn't donate that's what he said. It's, it's, it looks like a like a like a like a corn like a giant cornfield. And I was looking out of a window on the second floor, so I was in the educational building. And I said, "What is that? And who owns that?" And he said, "We own that. BP gave that to us." We have an intergovernmental agreement that we work through the city of Warrenville to uh, capture some BP land to use for our site water detention because we didn't have that. So. Uh, we, we have a joint agreement to use that and you know, we have to maintain it, but it's for site storage for our property. It's, it looks like a, it's, it's a detention base and it's yeah. got, I know that it just got mowed down pretty yeah, well. So um, so that that's usually holding water or, or something like that. It's not anything we can go on and use per se. Um, getting back to one of the, getting back to one of the Anyway, it's one other thing that um, Mrs. Crabtree um, asked to be explored in relationship to this site was, uh, uh, you know, building an early childhood center here and then relocating the SSC to uh, leased space. Um, and I was just, in my view, if I think about it, I would think that an early childhood center would have to have a larger footprint. Correct me if I'm wrong. 
than this building has, and we would not want a two-story building for you know two or three year olds who have physical problems. So, I mean, is that was that looked at? Was that considered? Because I know that was one of the things that we talked about was wanting to perhaps uh, abandon this as an office building. It's an old office building. We can rent office space anywhere. Uh, what about putting it here or selling the land over there and having it in here? So, I mean, could you give me the uh, reason that won't work? <laughs> you know, just for the public and for... Yeah, and Mike, I don't know if you've looked specifically at uh, at a footprint here. I, number one, I think just due to stormwater issues, I don't think you could expand the footprint of this right. building. So anything you did within this space, I think, would have to fit within kind of the existing footprint of this uh, this space, uh, and, and I think that would be very difficult just given the the tiered grade of. Of this building, um, we could we could certainly explore the issue of could you expand the footprint here, but I don't I don't know that that would be possible to do the stormwater issues. Right, but, but, the, but the footprint of an early childhood center would be definitely larger than the existing footprint of the SSC. Is am I right in assuming that? Correct. Okay. What is the square footage of this building? Nineteen thousand. Yeah, really. Build, if it was a new building, which there's other things on the table we haven't talked about yet tonight, but build a new building there versus build a new building here is basically the same construction cost, but then you add the significant impact of stormwater and, and parking, traffic circulation, neighbor neighbor impact. We had that last time, you're going to have it here equally. Uh, the potential loss of play fields that are used every night, I believe, in the summer. Um, so I don't, I don't know that. You're basically building the same building, with the exception of maybe some couple thousand square foot difference if you're able to share the gymnasium. Um, I think you create so many additional complications by putting it here versus putting it up if it was the Jefferson site that I don't think you're going to see cost I wasn't suggesting that it be done. I was just suggesting that we let the public know that it was considered so that if we do end up where we ended up last time, which was building in the building on the same site, they know that we considered building it somewhere else and moving our offices <laughs> elsewhere. That means, I, I, I didn't think the answer would be yes, we could fit it right here. But I wanted to be sure. And I wanted the public to be sure. And if we had it, if we were able to do that, since we're talking about it in public, <laughs> um, and took on a lease, and then that lease payment then falls into our operating budgets which has to be found with money so if it impacts it impacts cut somewhere else so that's a, a different complication well, it's not test service so. and, and, I, and i understand that but i think if the public knows we're going to do that if we build that into our plan then we do that i mean i, I don't think we should make a decision on what happens to this building based on where it falls as a line item in our budget I think we should make that based on good common sense. And then, if the, if the community believes that our good common sense was indeed good common sense, then I think <coughs> we will support it. I have faith in our community that they will do that. If, if it makes more sense to lease space for offices, which are just offices, then, you know, there are other, other districts that have done that, and it, you know, it makes sense to do that. If, it, if it's an economic, uh, advantage to us to do that, whether it comes out of this budget or that budget, who cares? I, I think it's worth doing a little bit more detailed analysis of that. Um, you know, the other benefit of that would be if you're able to do that here, then you vacate or abandon the existing Jefferson site. So when we do that, land, there's, there's probably some community benefit in doing that. Um, so I, I, guess I, I guess I'm talking myself, or maybe you're talking me into it. You know, if we were to look at a little bit more detailed analysis of this site, recognizing that there's some pretty substantial complications, whether it's even feasible, um, I'm not opposed to it. I think of all the elementary school sites, it's the only one, the only one that's even you know, maybe worth looking at. And my other thought was, uh, since we're considering our facilities as a whole, then maybe maybe we do as part of our comprehensive strategic facility plan, if we don't end up with an early childhood center on this side, 
we still end up with an early childhood center like that where it is now, and then we still consider, do we really want to keep investing in this property here, or do we want to just sell it and, and lose space? And, and I realized that, uh, that, oh, I'm sorry, I thought I had it up. I must have hit it up. I, I realized that, um, uh, you know, maybe the city would want to buy it, but I would think that if they would want it for stormwater detention, retention, whatever you want to call it, I would think they would have to give us uh, a fair market value for it. And when you take when you seize property for that reason, I don't, I don't know. I just don't know. I just think we should explore it. Because eventually we have to do something with this building. Right? I mean, it's in disrepair and it floods and... Yeah, there, there are capital repairs that uh, again, our, uh, we have, have that those items identified and incorporated as part of the capital plan, but um, certainly we can do that. So um, it, let, let me, I think, kind of summarize where I think that we were at in terms of, of this. So uh, uh, again, we are going to look at, at a, again, look at a refined concept cost for the three individual middle school projects um, that pulls together the capital and the, the educational improvements. Um, we're going to return with a refined Sandberg number that pulls those two pieces together. Uh, we're going to take a look at, uh, at, I think, what JR shared with you tonight in terms of that look at the, the capital side. So absent those, um, we'll, we'll capture that uh, accurately uh, in a bucket. And then we're going to return with a refined uh, concept plan around Jefferson Early Learning Center. And again, just based on the conversation last time, um, there are still two active considerations and then one concept that we haven't completely dismissed, uh, active consideration being a new building. Uh, obviously look at a, at, a, at a revised concept for that. We're gonna look at, uh, at a running a test fit on this site to see if it is in fact uh, a doable option. And then the concept from the last time we haven't found another available piece of property in the school district that could be retrofit, but we are still looking actively open to, uh, to that concept if, uh, if we do identify another piece of property that could be renovated into an early learning center. But just in terms of, of, of bringing you new concept information, we are gonna focus on developing that new building option, relooking at that to make sure there's an updated cost associated with it, and then we're gonna run, run a test fit on this property. Can I, can I also ask that we look at something with Woodland? For example, you know, is there a place elsewhere within our district to do what Woodland does to be able to say, maybe we want to sell that property and be able to apply it to something else? I mean, if we're having the conversations about the SSC, that we should look at all of our facilities. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we, and, um, <coughs> We that's a that's been a part of, of our conversation to to some degree where there's potentially available space to relocate a couple of things within Woodland kind of depend on what happens with the rest of the plan that that we're talking about but but yes we will make sure Woodland is an active part of that conversation. Just to continue the list on the early childhood, so those are the options we're going to continue looking at. We've taken three off the table. We've taken the concept of doing the additional renovation on an existing building off the table. We've taken converting the industrial warehouse on the far edge of Warrenville off the table and then and then the notion of kind of fitting fitting our program somehow into the community center for the Wheaton Park District off the table. So we put new things on and we've taken several things off. And I'd like to take that one step further. Maybe my email to Dr. Schuler wasn't uh, precise enough, but uh, as I reflect on uh, this conversation, as we're trying to be creative and thinking outside the box, my my position is that we look at, uh, as an example, Hubble. You know, that school is built for 1,100 students. We've got about 60% capacity, and those numbers are probably going down, if nothing more flat. And it's a beautiful building, and I would think that we need to give serious consideration on how we might be able to better utilize, not better, but utilize the remaining space that was built for 1,100 students, and how we can take uh, that footprint in some way or form or fashion. I'm not smart enough to figure that out, but to utilize that space to accommodate 
an early childhood center arrangement, which daily has 150 students in that current scenario. Well, you know, we call it 200 a day, but it appears, again, I'm not smart to know all this stuff, but it appears that with a building that's sitting there that's at 55 or 60 percent occupancy and staying consistent, if not maybe going down, that might be good consideration to say how can we effectively use an asset we've got that's very current, very new, very modern, and and, and, and put into that scenario uh, a spot that could assist uh, our needs for early childhood center. And I agree with Brad. I don't think we take anything off the table, especially if you continue to look at other sites that we could renovate, lease, or whatever the case may be. But I think this has at least consideration. I'd like to have the staff at least give that some thought and, and maybe give us some feedback. Yeah, uh, what, one of the things that uh, I think we certainly can do related to Hubble as we did for the other three middle schools is, well, for all of the buildings really absent Hubble in the report, uh, we gave you a capacity analysis and a heat map. And why, why don't we do that for Hubble, which I think will be kind of the first look at, at beyond just the numbers, what the utilization of space would be within the building. And I think that would inform that, that discussion. And this leads me to something that I has been percolating in my mind. I know that when we built Hubble, we built Hubble with the idea that the students from Lowell would be coming to Hubble, and then the students from Lowell uh, decided to go to Lincoln, and then Lincoln feeds Edison. So is there a possibility of uh, moving students around to balance those buildings. I know we're, we're looking at a lot of money going into Edison. I don't believe that's because extra students are going there. I don't believe any of that money going into Edison is to accommodate an increase in enrollment. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, so, uh, you know, if, but if, if, so if, if we did have that scenario where Edison was starting to get overcrowded and Hubble, you know, stayed low, but I, I know that we don't. I know we, did, we purposely did not overbuild Hubble. It was a, it was a thing that kind of happened when the Denada North neighborhood uh, uh, switched over to go to Lincoln from Lowell. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, if if any of our situations here can be solved through enrollment changes, that's obviously a lot less. It, it's painful, but it's a lot less expensive than than adding bricks and mortar to all of that. So uh, so when we're looking in total, I would ask that we consider those issues as well. Okay. Any further comments on our master facility plan discussion? If not, we'll move to the community engagement plan report. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit of a stand-in here. Uh, Mrs. Leocano had to leave uh, this, this evening. So uh, I'm going to just walk through a couple of pieces of, uh, of, of her report. And, and I think it's important to understand on this as, a, as an oral report and a discussion topic, I think tied in not only to the master facility plan discussion that we've just had, but some ongoing discussions that we've, we've, we've had on how it is that we can continue to be uh, very focused on engaging our, our entire community. I think the, the goal tonight um, was, was just to solicit input on, you know, the overall uh, master planning effort. And so, um, again, community engagement obviously is a, is a significant strand of the Vision 2018 strategic plan that the board has established. It was a, a significant piece of feedback out of the Engage uh, 200 process and making sure that we continue to stay in tune with our with our community and it's obviously been a significant goal. Uh, and, and so uh, a big part of this in terms of celebrations for, for this year, um, certainly both through video and through print uh, media, uh, a big, uh, we've, we've invested a lot of time focused on the concept of facilities this year, um, but also being able to highlight uh, some of the critical stories and developments out of our educational services department, future of instruction and technology, um, a, a lot of the, the new curriculum elements. Um, uh, here, I, I'm, I'm a smidge out of my league as I'm talking about social media stats, and I apologize for it, but 
uh, Erica shared uh, really the, the increase uh, that we've had in our social media presence. We partnered with uh, uh, a couple of, uh, of former employees to launch uh, what we call a, an Emeritus 200 Facebook page. That's really uh, means uh, a few former employees uh, that we're trying to stay connected with the district. We've got a little over 1,700 Facebook likes and a little over 2,000 Twitter followers. Uh, on our website, um, a couple of statistics just in terms of uh, views to our website, that really continues to be the hub of, of communication efforts. And so even as we've expanded other opportunities, I think the, the goal as you reach out through other electronic means is to ultimately draw people back to your website where you have the, the, the preponderance of your information that, uh, that they can navigate through. Um, and we've obviously continued to, uh, to work with our, our local media outlets um, through a monthly superintendent column, and we had over 70 uh, media placements this year uh, through them. Um, we've also continued to, uh, to expand uh, our, our relationships with some of our other key partners. Um, we've done a lot in conjunction with the Wheaton Chamber of Commerce this year. Um, our Universal Access Initiative, we've worked hard with the, the Chamber of Commerce to uh, to address, we obviously continue to work closely with the park district and the, and the public library, and then along the bottom uh, are all of our municipal uh, partners that, that again uh, we, we continue to work closely with. Um, this year, I think the board is uh, is aware that uh, we um, I don't want to say we, we recreated because I know we did do one of them in the past, but we brought back the realtor uh, breakfast this year. Uh, Joanne really helped us to connect to our realtors and, uh, and, and re-engage them uh, in that annual breakfast, which we plan to continue. Um, we, we've continued to invest time both through board liaison and through staff liaisons to the new 200 and that uh, foundation and obviously our PTA councils that continue to be very instrumental both in terms of uh, the financial support they provide, but more important on a communication basis. Um, those are regular groups that we work closely with, and then you heard the update earlier at the front end of the meeting on the Citizens Advisory uh, Committee, which was a, a new outreach this year. Um, Family Day of Play. Uh, Joanne, you probably know uh, more about Family Day of Play than I. Any comment you want to offer on that tied to the Early Learning Collaborative? Sure. Yeah, we actually just <coughs> talked about this today. There were over um, 70 families, and um, I was positive about 50 to 60 children um, at the Family Day of Play, which was on April 16th. Um, and it was held at Hubble, and the whole goal of this Family Day of Play was really to bring the community together um, and giving resources to our families, um, connecting them with uh, basically any of the public agencies and service providers that um, can help families be um, keeping an eye on their children and the developmental milestones and any resources and having them uh, be prepared for kindergarten. That's one of our goals of our collaboration is to provide services and collaborative efforts for our students. Uh, and then uh, community engagement, I know it's, uh, the board is well aware we did a number of community engagement sessions this year around uh, the master facility plan in the fall. Um, we, we did our state of the schools and really took that out on the road to as many uh, different civic organizations uh, as we could, again, to try to reach uh, beyond just the, the walls of our, our school building. And so uh, kind of the, the highlights. Uh, uh, as Erica has built uh, kind of the work plan for this year. So you have this placemat sized uh, uh, community engagement uh, work plan. Um, we've, we've continued to look at putting a, a heavier emphasis on some two way opportunities for communication. Uh, so a lot of our uh, weekly print communications are really one way tools, tools that just go out and inform on, on things that are happening. but. Uh, the, the expansion of the Realtor Breakfast of Citizens Advisory Committee uh, of that State of the Schools Roadshow is really about trying to expand some opportunities um, to also make sure that, uh, that we enhance that two-way communication. Um, uh, working on, with the support of the foundation, expanding an alumni uh, outreach effort. Uh, again, we've got a lot of District 200 alumni living in or very close uh, to our area, and so um, we've, we've been launching in conjunction with 200 with the new 200 alumni outreach uh, effort trying to, to build that. There is uh, an alumni association in the area that there's been some conversation about you know how we can we can really work together around that. Um, 
certainly we anticipate uh, some community engagement around this facility plan that we're talking about. So um, as the, the plan continues to get developed, we're going to have to be really, really cognizant on how uh, we engage the community around this. And, and again, Citizens Advisory Committee is something uh, that we would, would recommend that obviously we continue with next year based on, uh, on that interest. Um, so questions that, uh, that Erica had, had identified, uh, and again, uh, certainly you know, we, can, we can entertain any early thoughts or feedback tonight or you know, look at them over the, the next month. We're a little bit early in looking at the community engagement plan because we want to be uh, really intentional about it. Um, what are we missing? Are there, are there kind of key um, uh, communication elements or segments of our community that we need to have a more focused effort around uh, getting to? Certainly community engagement is one area where um, I, I do rely uh, heavily on your feedback collectively as a board representing uh, our, our community. What, you know, are, what are we missing out of the plan? Uh, are there any efforts that you, know, you, you don't see significant value in that we should abandon in terms of, of those communication uh, plans? So uh, I'll, I'll stop talking and entertain any early thoughts you have. What about our, our, our faith-based groups that are out there in the community? I, I, you know, we are a, a, a town that has probably more churches per capita than, than most communities. Are there, are there groups that we can get out, you know, be in touch with just to get the word out there about our schools more than anything, just to educate the community? It's another tool um, maybe that they would, you know, welcome a, a road show or um, you know, versus maybe getting a, a newsletter emailed to them. But maybe sometimes it's just making that making that connection. Okay. Um, first of all, um, I really am happy to see the um, annual state of the district uh, remain, you know, as part of an uh, annual thing. Um, and I'd like to keep it focused on district accomplishments. Here's where we are, you know, and then obviously here, here's where we need your help. Here's what we need you th to think about. I think that worked out really well last year. And um, I, think, I think if we keep that as an annual thing, uh, I think that could only benefit us uh, and, and benefit the community. They'll, they'll know what we're up to, they'll know the challenges we face, and, uh, and, and they'll give us their feedback. <coughs> Um, in terms of adding something to the plan, uh, I know there are a lot of communications in here, you know, something from the board, newsletter from the board. I, I would like to somehow make sure that when the community gets information, they understand that the board is involved in it. Because I'm not sure we're still, we're still having that disconnect. When we had our community engagement sessions, um, there were people who were saying, well, we didn't hear enough from the board about, you know, Jefferson. We didn't really hear from the board. And there just wasn't that connection between what was coming out from the superintendent and from the communications and the board. So I would, I would like to see more personal communication from the board through the board president. And, and uh, uh, I, I just think that that can do nothing but help us as well so that they understand that the, the team includes the board and they understand the board's role in, in placing the district where we are. So I think that would be the one thing that I would say add to the plan. Um, but I, I think this year was a very good year uh, for communicating you know, with the community. Um, I, I would like to be able to drag them off the street, <laughs> you know. But I think anything we can do to uh, reach out more and uh, and and be present in the community if we can, as board members, can take some of that load, uh, you know, with a script or whatever. I mean, I think, especially the officers, I think that would be good for us to, to say, you know, we support what's going on, we voted for it, uh, we, we, uh, we understand, you know, we've looked at what you wanted and we've, and we've, and we've done it. So I, I just would like to kind of make that connection stronger. 
too, if anything that we can do to reach that 75%, whether it be more getting involved to more of the, the, the senior groups, and even I think even, you know, I, I think I've mentioned this before, you know, we could Skype a Jefferson, you know, show or an elementary, you know, musical to these senior groups as, as a way of entertainment, you know, as they meet. I know my in-laws do a lunch bunch in, in Warrenville. I know that they would probably love that opportunity to see a musical and, you know, be able to get to that, make that more of a connection um, with that sub segment of our population and our schools. <coughs> Um, wherever people live, but they're very, their little niche community is, you know, everybody knows everybody, and it, um, there, I wish there were more associations, like where I live, I live in a subdivision, and we have, email each other, and because we have bylaws, so it's a little more reason that you have to be connected. Um, but if we somehow try to reach through them, or even, um, can we clever it with the uh, park district? I'm sure they want their information to get out, and we want ours, or tag on to some meeting where a lot of people show up. But I don't know. We need to brainstorm probably to help Erica, but, they, but uh, Erica and uh, you, Dr. Schiller, have done an outstanding job. I think really made steps this past year uh, or two to be very conscientious about it and. Yeah, I've been very pleased, but yeah, there's more ways to have it, more of Buzz Talk or a place to go or get them to go to our website. I'm not sure if you can find that person with Miss Know-It-All in every suburb of every area. Uh, I'll have to think about that. Yeah. All right, you want ideas? <coughs> I've got three ideas. Actually, the third one I wasn't even going to mention, but <laughs> you kind of brought it up, and I'm not sure it's a good idea, but um, you know, I've been struggling a little bit with the chance to chats we have, which are great when we go meet to the two high schools and hear from the kids, the, the, the students at the high schools, but from the community standpoint, I mean, we have three of them, we're lucky to get a dozen people between these three three meetings. So, you know, <clears throat> again, I don't know if this is a good idea, but, you know, is there some kind of, do you have a mini chance to chat with the board where maybe the first Friday of every month, you, group of people can get 10 people to come and you can meet with two board members for an hour or something like that where we can individually schedule depending on our, our other work commitments that if somebody gathers up 10 people and contacts the school district and we've got we want to go talk about an issue and it's 10 a.m. on Friday morning the first Friday of every month and we figure out which two board members can kind of listen <coughs> it's a different way to, to create that two-way communication in a, in a in a way that we're offering the opportunity, and if you can get enough people here and you want to have that, we'll do it. I know it's a bigger time commitment, but maybe that's a way to, to fill something else out on this two-way side. Another two-way communication I think that's worth exploring, and I know I've shared with Dr. Schuler and I think Eric has looked at it, but there's some online tools and services that I've been exposed to in my business that um, you know people, we can we can sign up. People, anybody in the community can register with a very simple information, name, what's, uh, email address, and it's a way for us to kind of pose out to people who've registered a question or a series of issues that we want feedback on. Um, I think it could be done fairly cost effectively. It's a different way. You know, people still have to sign up. That's the big problem. Is, you know, we can push out all the information we want, but we can't make people want to be engaged. Um, so that's another idea. And then, and then, the first one, I'm going backwards in my list, um, and I, I think I brought this up previously, but it's how do we how do we try to reach out to the, all those citizens, voters who don't have kids in the school? So we have this e-blast e that we push out every week, and it's so easy to sign up and put your name and put your email address. It takes like you know, 30 seconds. Is there some way we can do a little mini campaign directly to people's mail mailbox that if they want to sign up and get information? All I gotta do is go to this link, put your name in, it will give you information. That's that's an effort to try to get people information. Like I said, we can do that all we want to, but if, if people don't want to be engaged, we're not gonna do anything. But I think it's it would be a worthwhile effort to to try to do that in some fashion. So those are my three ideas. 
Jim? Do you have any comments? No. I have a couple comments. I raised this last year and it's kind of a takeoff on what Brad mentioned. I don't know why we have to confine our chat with the board to our two high schools and the SSC. I thought maybe we could go to the community center at one time or the Warrenville Public Library, the Public Library. It's an effort to reach out to the community. And maybe just because somebody happens to walk into the Wheaton Public Library from the 75%, they'll sit down and chat with us. Or the well, Warrenville Public Library. They're going to publicize it on their door. Right. And right. then. You know, yeah. if people walk in the library every day or whatever, they'll maybe come back on Saturday. And Dr. Schuller, I, I, I think all of us appreciate the updates we get from you at our board meetings and then periodically through emails about what's happening down in Springfield as far as what legislation is pending. Uh, Senator Menard's uh, funding formula bill, the uh, um, 2020 vision funding formula. I'd like to have at least uh, you and Eric consider uh, including in the Friday focus perhaps a paragraph or two on legislative developments that may be impacting us. I know that that information is available in the Daily Herald from time to time, or the Tribune, or, or on, even on TV and radio. But the more often we can get it out there to our residents, uh, the more I think they'll be able to appreciate uh, all the different challenges uh, that we're facing, not only with, from within the district here, but from the mess down in Springfield as well. Yeah, I concur. I, I, this engagement plan, this communications plan that we've had the last year or so has done a tremendous job. But when we made our presentation on community engagement at the IESB and folks that attended that, uh, they were, I have to say, were impressed by the efforts we made in here. Say, let's keep it up. So, so getting back to the chance to chat, you know, when we first started that, we had the monthly, and that was too many. So then we went down to like quarterly, and now we're down to what three, three a year, two each. You know, and I, I would hate to abandon the high school ones. I think those are so valuable to listen to what our students have to say. Um, but maybe, I like your suggestion of instead of having one here, let's say we have one at, you know, Windermere, or we have one at the Wheaton Public Library, and another one maybe at the Warrenville Public Library. So would you say five, four, six? What, what number would you say would be the number you would like to start with? I'm just curious to what commitment I'm making now. Perhaps we can combine it with uh, Brad's suggestion that we have to keep in mind our, commit, our obligation was under the Open Meeting Act as well, but uh, you know, we want to have a meaningful representation, but uh, uh, we could have six chats with the board, uh, and necessarily wouldn't have to include all members of the board. Uh, I certainly would hope all members could attend, uh, but uh, um, I have the benefit of being retired, so I can attend chats with the board, so. but uh, that's not the number I have in mind. I like libraries everywhere. I love them. I need to go into there. Go into there. Libraries. The jewel. <laughs> <laughs> Bill. Jewel. 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 I'm sorry, so close. Mark Allen. Jewel. 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 Written reports, we've all received the monthly financial report and the employee requests. Uh, reports from board members. Are there any committee reports? Uh, other reports from board members? Uh, just want to, Wheaton Morningville South High School is my adopted school. And I believe it's a week from tonight, they're having a senior this program at 7 o'clock. So if you have the time and can afford to be there, I think can possibly be there, you might want to put that on your calendar. I'd like to uh, share, um, I had the opportunity today, I think it was Faith, you did the presentation at the Committee of the Whole in February, and we had three teachers that came in, and um, Dr. Jen Wolf um, put the charge out there if anybody would like to come and visit, and Humboldt happens to be my one of my adopted schools, so I spent the morning there this morning. And 
I have to tell you, after a weekend of reading that we had to do, this kind of reaffirms why we're here, spending the time with the kids. And she um, asked me to have conversations with her students. Well, I sat down with every single student today in her in her eighth grade language arts class and talked to them about their projects, talked to them about their fit experience. They were so excited to share. And I, I, they, they were able to, they were doing what's called an um, I share project where it was a, it's a lot of research, it's the biggest research project they've done all year, and I think it's important for us as board members to kind of hear that you know we, we see that we see the on, on paper what we're trying to do with it, but to be able to then go into a classroom and see, and I, I ask students questions such as you know what makes this project better than maybe another project, and every single one of them said. I get to choose my topic, I get to really delve into it. I mean, in the topic choices, one of them was um, graffiti and street art, and another one did it on how do you become a pro basketball player, interviewed Stacey King, they had to do interviews with people, they, they had to do a variety of research options, I asked questions about when is the majority of this work being done, the majority of this being done in the classroom, I asked questions about do people have the technology that they need? I found out that the majority of eighth, uh, eighth graders at Hubble do have their own phone to be able to um, use. However, they do check out a cart every day. Um, and, and I really kind of got to just the excitement on their face and their, and their willingness to share of all the different things that they were doing. It was great to see. It was a wonderful way um, to, spend my, to spend my morning today. And um, I look forward to being able to go in and see some of the other things that are Any other reports from board members? If not, we will proceed to topics for future discussion. We'll be discussing the master facility plan report, the 2016-2017 budget. We'll begin our review of vision 2018 and goal setting. And uh, we'll be receiving a progress report on social emotional learning and an update. Our next regular meeting is June 8th. 7.30 p.m. here. And do we have public comments on agenda items? We do not. <clears throat> so we're about to move to closed session. The closed session items are listed for possible action. The appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district under 5 ILCS 120-2, subparagraph C, subparagraph 1. And collect negotiating matters between the district and its employees or the representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees <coughs> under 5 ILCS 120 slash 2, sub paragraph C, sub paragraph 2. I ask for a motion and a second to adjourn the closed session for the purpose of discussing the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district under 5 LS. Uh, else, ILCS 120-2, subparagraph C, subparagraph 1, and collective negotiating matters between the district and its employees or the representatives. The deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees under 5, ILCS 120-2, subparagraph C, subparagraph 2. No action is expected following the third session. Do I have a motion on a second? As long as I don't have to repeat it. <laughs> you don't. I so move. Moved by Mrs. Intar. Second. Seconded by Mr. Paulson. Ms. Sunday, would you please call the roll? Mrs. Intahar? Yes. Mr. Paulson? Yes. Mr. Gambiani? Yes. Mrs. Crabtree? Yes. Mrs. Conkill? Yes. Mr. Roman? Yes. The motion passes. Right. Now move to closed session. <laughs> Thank you.